Welcome to track three, guys. Woo! All right, this is the best one because it is lightning talks. So that means that these people, these brave souls, were struck by inspiration, struck by lightning, signed up upstairs with uh, topics that they were inspired to talk about while they were at other SauceCon events. Um, we have all sorts of different people. We have a director of engineering, we have uh, a couple saucers, we have automators, so you're gonna get a lot from these. And we have six different speakers, and I'm very excited to introduce you to all of them. I have a cool fact about each one of them, so get ready to absorb a cool fact about them and then hear their super awesome lightning talk. So I'm gonna start with Enrique. Um, he definitely is gonna need your warm round of applause when, when I get to it, but I need to, to say that, you could come on up. I need to say the um, fun fact about Enrique, I don't know how fun it is, he doesn't eat dessert. So shed a little tear for Enrique because he only eats savory foods. Give him a, a big round of applause and he is going to say, remind me the title of your talk. Uh, it's uh, how we got our uh, developers to... Yes, how, how we got our developers to start testing. So give me a big round of applause for Enrique Mata Rodriguez. Hi there, um, my name is Enrique Mato, and I'm a Cloud QA engineer at uh, Elasticsearch. I, um, I came here to talk to you about how we got our devs to contribute to our test automation framework. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about is uh, it, we're still on our journey. It's still a continuous process and we're still refining things. So it's not perfect, but we're getting there. So uh, one day I wake up and I um, log into GitHub and I see a little notification, and I see that somebody contributed a test to our end-to-end -end framework. Um, just for some background, the end-to-end -end framework has been mainly maintained by myself and another developer, uh, Jessica Deandra, very awesome. Uh, but for the most part, we've been dealing with fixing the framework, ensuring that it works, adding some enhancements, but we didn't touch the scenarios. This PR had scenarios on it, and it came from a developer, uh, Sam Nelson, who does not do any UI work. He doesn't work with JavaScript. Uh, he's a Scala developer uh, and works in the API framework stuff. So when I saw this, it gave me hope and a reassurance, really, that the path that we're going towards for developers contributing to test automation is here. Um, they've been contributing to the Scala test, the end-to-end -end test, and uh, it's been awesome, and I just wanted to go over a little bit of how we got to this point. Um, and there's two big variables here. There's some hard deliverables and some soft deliverables. The hard deliverable is pretty easy. It's just make it easy to develop against. Um, ensure that it's the same language, same repo, put it as part of the build process. Um, make sure your framework is both stable and approachable. Make sure it's documented. Uh, one of the drawbacks is, is when you create a framework, you think you're doing it great, um, but at the end of the day, if nobody's contributing it, it's not approachable. So make sure you get that feedback about how, it's, uh, how it is to develop against it. Um, and finally, make sure the results are consumable and easily accessible. Um, we send a Slack notification with the percentage of tests that passed and failed. We, for the end-to-end -end tests, since Jenkins UI is not that great, we use a little reporting. Make it something that is pleasurable for the developer to see and utilize and actually uh, have some action items off of it. Finally is the soft deliverables, and I believe this is the big contributor to how our developers are working uh, towards our framework. Um, first is be available to, for them. Uh, if they have questions, make sure that you're there for them. Make sure that you convey that this framework exists and please add to it. Um, second is be fair with your PRs. Don't be soft, don't just accept any pull request and merge it in, but be fair and understand that Yes, it might not meet your standards. It might have some libraries or some ways of how you handle uh, automation just a little bit different. And if that bothers you, push it to the back, deal with it in another PR in the future, but, let, uh, but bring them into the whole process of test automation. Um, and finally, take your criticism. 
Um, my framework originally was not good. I took some hits and I talked to the developers and I said, what do you need to make sure that it's, uh, that'll work for you? And they said, we needed to make it something that's easily executable. So we utilize Docker for our Selenium runs. We utilize uh, some libraries to make sure that if they can not utilize Docker, because it won't hit localhost properly, then we could spin up Selenium for them in the background. So um, when, we, when I saw that PR from Sam, which was unsolicited and came out of nowhere, uh, again, it reaffirmed that we're going towards the right path uh, towards the ICD. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'm available for questions after this. Um, and my, again, my name's Enrique Mata from Elasticsearch. Thank you. Hello. Oh, okay, I'm on. Um, I am running to grab information about who's next, so I'm going to tell you something while I'm doing that. I don't think most people realize this, but yesterday, while you guys were going to all the SauceCon talks, it was pouring rain outside. Um, this building was <laughs> struck by lightning, so you're in the lightning talks. I promise you I am not kidding. It is a testament to the SauceCon staff and the Hyatt staff that you guys had no idea this building was literally struck by lightning. So I just thought you should know that. Um, let's see who's next up. Okay. Oh, this is exciting. So our next speaker is a director of engineering who comes from Seattle. She is, no? She's an engineering manager um, who comes from Seattle. Uh, and she owns a Lippitz on her horse named Jade with whom she does classical dressage. Um, and I want to introduce you guys to Melissa Benua, who is going to talk to you about manual testing. Her talk is called Manual Testing is Dead, Not. It's not dead, so give a round of applause for Melissa. Hey, guys. So manual testing is dead. That's a phrase that you may have heard a lot this week. Manual testing is dead. And so when somebody really wants to get your attention, that's what they say. When they want to really rile you up or start a discussion or really, really get, get at you, that's what they love to say. Manual testing is dead. But what does that actually mean? So in software testing in particular, we have a terminology problem. When I say, I have an integration test suite, what that means to me is not what that means to you. I may have a very different definition of what integration in terms of testing means for my product than what it may mean for yours. If I say, yeah, we do UI validation, we have a UI test, what I may mean is that, yeah, we run Selenium against a sandboxed and you know, data mocked out part of our UI to validate UI functionality. What you may mean by UI tests is that you run end-to-end -end application level testing of your entire system from the UI level. Two very different things, but they're often masquerading as the same term. And so, when we talk about manual testing as dead, what do we actually mean by manual testing? And so what I believe people are talking about when they say that, is they're referring to functional validation of regression tests. They mean finding bugs of implementation manually. Finding that, whoops, the developer did a minus minus instead of a plus plus. They should have returned null here, and instead they returned a new object. Finding places where a developer just screwed up. And yeah, you know, those are going to be less and less cases where we're finding those manually. Automation is great for finding regression, test, regression bugs. Regression test suites are reliable, they run fast. Very, very, you know, very reasonable thing to say that manual regression testing is a, you know, is a contracting field, is a dying field. But that's only half the story. There are two types of bugs that, that we can write in our application. There's these bugs of implementation, but then there's the bugs of understanding, where a scenario owner may have given you a scenario and they may have just put some requirements there, and for whatever reason, the developer didn't deliver what the scenario owner meant to the requirements. Perhaps they misunderstood. Perhaps the requirements were unclear. Oftentimes, you know, it's unusual for requirements to be perfect. Um, and so, Bugs of understanding are very hard to find automatically because they involve, you know, generally speaking, touching many different pieces. They involve taking on the role of the user, of the customer. Very, very hard to automate. 
So, you know, say that the scenario owner says, we're going to have a menu over here and it's going to be green. And the developer says, all right, green. Uh, my favorite green is teal. So I'm going to make this menu teal. Well, if the developer writes a regression test, they're going to check that it's, the menu is showing up in the right color and it may be functionally correct. But if the scenario owner, when they said green, meant, you know, true hunter green, then that's a bug. It's a bug of understanding. And no amount of automation is going to catch that bug. Only the scenario owner running through the scenario as they intended it is going to see, oh, this isn't, this isn't right. This isn't what the customer needed. We need to fix this. So when we're saying manual testing is dead, we're not talking about this part where we advocate for the customer. When we take the role of the customer and say, here's our product, here's how it works, here's how we're going to make sure that this is the right thing and what our customers need. And whether that job, that validation of bugs of understanding belongs to somebody whose title is QA engineer, somebody whose title is pro, you know, product manager, somebody whose title is, is scenario owner in, in scrum terms, it doesn't matter. That field and that functionality isn't going anywhere. There's no good way to get rid of it. And in fact, getting rid of finding those bugs of understanding just means that your customers are going to find them for you. And so next time somebody says to you, manual testing is dead, you should say, well, I'm not doing manual testing. I'm fighting for my users. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was so great. Um, so our next speaker flew in all the way from Australia, so he's tired, because um, that's a long flight. Um, he also, his name is Dylan Lacey, and he works at Sauce Labs, one of the oldest Sauce Labs employees, or one of the, um, he's worked at Sauce the longest of many, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for, most tenured Sauce Labs employees. He's also an incredible cook. Uh, his talk, Dylan Lacey's talk, is called What's in a Name? Using Sauce Metadata for Fun and Profit. So uh, my interest is definitely peaked. Let me get a warm welcome for Dylan. I'm just trying to get my slides up. Um, as you all know, people of my advanced age are unable to use technology. <laughs> Alrighty. So thanks for the welcome, everybody. Uh, as Sam said, my name is Dylan Lacey, and I work for the support department for Source Labs. Um, and this talk is about metadata. So metadata, meta anything, refers to that thing about itself. So for those of you who've seen the musical Wicked, Wicked was originally a book. It was a book about a book. So it was metafiction. Metadata is data about data. So when we talk about tests, our test metadata are whether a test passed or failed, what browser it ran on, what its name is, what environment it was against. Anything that isn't about what the test actually did, but is a bit about how the test did, why the test did, that's what metadata is. So on Source Labs, metadata is things like the build, the success, the name, custom data, tags, the browser, etc. And why I think you should care about metadata is for three reasons. It helps you narrow down what your failure conditions are. It helps you check what your test coverage is. And it helps you explain context of tests to others, like your manager. In this case, your oddly wide manager. Now, why do I care about you caring about test data? Because it makes my job easier. The reason it makes my job easier is it makes it easier to help you. If you reach out to support and say, hey, I have this test, it fails 50% of the time. If your metadata is bad enough, I might have no idea which of your tests are actually impacted. We spend a lot of our time looking at customers' tests holistically through our business intelligence tool. And if all of your tests have terrible names, and I can't tell which one's passed or failed, it means that the time we're going to take in order to help your tests get back to where they should be is going to be longer. And we don't want that. We want your tests to be helping you know when your things passed or failed. If you don't know whether they failed because the test was broken or not, that's, that's not good for either of us. So what is a good name? I'm, I'm not going to go through most of our other kinds of metadata. I just want to talk about names because I only have five minutes. A good name is 
unique. It distinctly represents the one thing you're trying to do. No other test should have a name, anything like it. It should just be one test by itself, a beautiful little snowflake. But it should also explain, kind of, what the test is. What is it trying to do? What's its unique identifier? How do I refer to that test when I send it to people? How do I refer to it when I look in my reporting? But maybe a barcode's also a bad idea, because it's more like DNA. It uniquely describes that test. It shows what it has in common with other tests, but it also shows that it stands alone. So names, that's what we're interested in. Here are some really bad names. These are all names that I kind of made up inspired by bad test names I've seen. These are the duplicates. Some test suites will give your tests a name and they're always terrible. Always, it's just a thing that happens. So you might have every single test named what test runner it run. Maybe if it's parallelized, it might be a little bit smarter and it goes, hey, I'm a karma test. Yeah, that really lets you figure out what's broken. Or maybe you don't send a name, you don't use our REST API or the desired capabilities, and so you end up with a completely unnamed test. Then there are the bad names that are confusing. Check login fails with input data one. Well, what? makes it fail. What is input data run? Uh, if we rerun release staging process test small smoke, no CDN. Does everybody in your company know what a CDN is? Do you remember what tests are in your small smoke test? Do you know what scenario 14 is or what data each user is meant to be sending by email? Do you know what Tyler did for performance optimization? Does it matter? Will that test ever need to run again? And what should work? Should is, in my opinion, a swear word. Should is what we'd like to have happen, but we're quality people, and we know that that is not what will happen. Then there are the cluttered tests, tests which include information that doesn't actually help us identify the test. No one is going to remember the number of the build there. Test TRV DENV Jenkins S1 B4 alternative sign up path is not going to be a catchy song lyric. The next one is just kind of hard to read. It looks like maybe they've included the name of some of the classes, some implementation details. That's useless information. And then the last one is all about what environments it ran on, what its unique identifier was, but not a human recognizable identifier. It's as good as saying, oh, look, that's my friend. T-C-D-A-D-G-G-A-G-T-C-A-D-A-G-G-A-T-C-A, -G -G -A -A -G -G right? Maybe that's Sam's DNA, but nobody knows Sam except as Sam. And then there are the test names, my favorite category, the ones that contain things that they shouldn't. You don't need your build ID in your test name. There's a separate section for it. If you're using a test runner like Jenkins, it's already going to track all of your names separately from the build ID. You don't need the platform details, Windows 10 underscore Chrome underscore 72 underscore user is invite. No, 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 no. You already know what platform it ran on. It ran on whatever platform you requested. On Source Labs, we have a whole bunch of filters for that. But unless you do all your cross-browser tests and then submit all your results together, your test runner probably does the same thing. You don't need to know what pull request was attached to a test. Tests aren't about the code, they're about the quality. Tests should always make sure an outcome has been achieved, and accepting a pull request, it's not an outcome. Neither is fixing a specific bug with one exemption that I will come to. And then environments. Doesn't matter what environment you ran a test on. Track that in custom data or tags or with your build. Don't put it in the test name. So what are some good test names? Um, these are some good examples. I made most of them up, but they are inspired by customers. So the first one tells us what we're trying to do, what a success is, and what data we used. Third-party data transfer completes for single valid entity. We don't need to know what the entity is to make it valid. We know what the scenario is testing. The next one is very shouty, but all in caps, renewal screen is displayed, so that's the condition. For subscribed users, that's a qualifier on the test, 12 days in advance. That's a bit about the data. And then the last one is the exemption I was talking about. Renewal screen is displayed full size for subscription users 12 days in advance on Chrome. I'm breaking my rule about platform here. Because imagine only Chrome breaks. Imagine Chrome has this, whatever we're trying to display, the renewal screen, imagine it shows up really tiny and on every other browser it works. That's the one case where the browser is actually relevant to your test because it has exceptional behavior that you know is there that you're trying to correct with new code. So I want to thank you. 
Uh, this is my cat, Galena. She's my support. If you need more support, please feel free to reach out to support at sourcelabs.com or holler at your CSM. They can always help you out. I hope this talk has been useful to, you, to us non-source customers, as well, to the non-source customers as well. And if you want to find me, uh, you can do so at Dylan Lacey, Dylan Lacey on LinkedIn, and the bit.ly link there will let you download these slides. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, our next presenter I met last night um, at the amazing street fair, and I, I'm sure I have seen him before. He also lives in Austin, and I'm going to tell you I've seen him. There is a group of people um, on Lady Bird Lake, which you can see from this hotel, maybe from your room, that do something called kayak polo, and Kyle Lutzi, who I'm about to introduce, moved to Austin specifically to play kayak polo. He is part of that group of people who you can see under the Mopac Bridge throwing balls with a polo stick in a kayak. It's very confusing. It looks really hard and he does it. Um, he is going to talk about making logs useful for uh, debugging. And yeah, give a round of applause for Kyle Lucy. <laughs> Showing up. Hey, there we go. Yeah, so I'm Kyle. I uh, work at Pearson Education primarily on two products called Realize and Realize Reader. And their purpose is uh, for users to, or well, students to be able to read ebooks, um, do assignments, and take assessments, amongst many other things. And some of the problems we've had with just testing and QA for that is. Uh, no matter uh, what all we test, and we have thousands of test cases and, and uh, just as many automated, uh, we can't test for all the combinations of data that we will receive. And the main reason for that is we ingest a lot of our data from third-party sources, like the uh, rostering data we get from schools for all their students. Every school has their own formats. Um, all of our content, like for the eBooks and whatnot, will come from third-party publishers. And uh, the assignments, same sort of thing. We get them from other people besides just us. And because of that, no matter how much testing we do, we will always end up with bugs in production. And uh, some of them won't even be caused by us. It'll be because of the data we get from third-party people, but because it's our platform, we get blamed for it. So basically, we get the problem of uh, the product managers will come up with uh, a user story that they want to have the developers develop. So they'll do that, then QA will test it, and then our users will do something crazy. So how do we deal with that? Uh, we make sure that in production, when they occur, we can figure out the cause of those issues quickly. And we do it by collecting a ton of logs from a ton of sources. So from the front end, we get user events of what they're doing. So that includes things like they've opened a book, or they've answered the first question of an assessment, um, or a teacher has gone in and added a new assignment for all their students. Uh, we also get any single JavaScript error that is going to the console also comes to our logging systems. Uh, on the back end, we get the usual uh, s uh, service messages that you would expect. Um, and so we log there a bad user uh, data input, uh, system faults, such as you can't reach another server, and general information about things that happen that we want to know about and we want uh, our developers and product people to know about, but uh, we can't give them access to the database to find out themselves. And then also ELB access logs, they get, or we collect that too, but that's more for uh, metrics and trend analysis. And all this data goes to Elasticsearch for us. And so this is an example of a user event that we get. And uh, we use uh, something called an XAPI spec that is used a lot for e-learning software. And so it gives us information about the user's browser, uh, what type of user they are, uh, their user ID, their organization or uh, school district ID, 
and what it is they were doing. So in this case, our uh, test automation was opening the fourth page of a book. And with this, we're able to filter in there uh, by, say, the user ID and follow their entire uh, user session and what they were doing. And that helps us quite a bit in uh, solving why they, or where they experienced a bug and what they're doing at the time of it. And then on the back end, we have things like uh, the service was unable to retrieve a user assignment. But with that, you need contextual data. Because in the beginning when we started looking, that was all the message said. So we had no idea who, the, or who was experiencing the error or what it is they're trying to access that didn't exist. And then the other thing we added, uh, since we are going down the microservices route, is a network trace ID. So that gets added in as a header at the very beginning. And as it goes through all the different services, you've got that trace ID. So you can say, was this problem because of this particular path? Or was it because uh, this similar error is occurring a whole bunch of times on one particular server in a cluster or something else? And of course, you want the stack trace of uh, the application server. The other thing that we've been working on doing is fixing up our logs because up until recently, uh, we had a lot of our services that were logging just about everything at the air level, including debug messages from uh, when they were first writing a particular method. And that produced a lot of white noise that we wanted to get rid of. So we broke it up partially, or also so uh, coming down the line, we can start doing uh, alerting based on the different error levels and what occurs there. So error messages, we keep that to exceptions of things that we aren't expecting to have happen, such as servers can't reach each other. Uh, warning messages for us are for uh, when we get bad user data or um, user data that's in the system is corrupted that we're trying to return to the user. Info messages are for things where, like I was talking about earlier, where stuff is happening and we want other people internally to know about, but we can't give them access to the database for them to find out there. And then debug and trace are for developers to uh, use in their lower tier environments, and we don't show those in production logs. Um, so yeah, I'm out of time, but uh, that's roughly how we made our system more useful to solve stuff faster in production. so much, Kyle. So our next presenter is actually a saucer. Um, he looks super young to me, but he actually spent 13 years in the Air Force. So I'd like to invite up Daniel Paulus, who is going to give a talk that we have all titled Nancy Drew and the Case of the Missing Appium Bug. Um, take it away, Daniel. OK, does that work? All right. OK, uh, I'm going to talk about something that's not entirely serious, although at the time it was pretty serious. Um, so brace yourselves. We're actually going to see some Appium code. So who never looked into that kind of code? That's going to be interesting for you. Um, so I, I, I opened this function, you know, and it looks like pretty you know, pretty innocent. It's called uh, get PIDs by name. And you know what it does, it basically gives you a list of PIDs for a process name. Nothing too crazy, right? Um, and then if you look at it, and I think like how the method works is probably obvious to everyone. Uh, if you look at it, like it has multiple strategies of how it does that. So, you know, you see some P grab, like parsing some stuff, so it's probably running like the ps command that maybe some of you know from Linux. It dumps you like a list of all running processes and you know it does some some regex stuff on that. And then also there is this comment and uh, spoiler, I'm actually the reason for that comment. Uh, it says, you know, also very innocent since PID off has been reported of having bugs on some platforms. Okay. And uh, you can see, like, at some point it's using PID off. And so let's go back to the presentation. Like, I think it was enough code for, the, uh, for now. So this is basically the function, you know, easily explained. Get PIDs by name, and you give it some process name, like, I don't know, nano. And it gives you a list of numbers that correspond with the IDs belonging to that process. So does anyone know why you would need such a function? Has anyone an idea what you would do with that? 
why would I want a list of PIDs? What could Appium do with that? Most likely it's used to kill things, right? So for each PID in that list, like Appium is at some point trying to kill something, uh, probably a process. So, and then let's look at how this can cause a real device related bug. So, what you're gonna see now, uh, I'm actually using the virtual USB feature we just built to connect to some real devices. In this case, it's a Nexus 6 and some Samsung device. And let's see what happens if I open a shell on the Nexus 6 first and you run this PID off command and I use something like uh, this. Ah, nice, I get a number. Makes sense, right? That's what you expect, you get a list of numbers. So then what happens if I do this? I get an empty string. That makes sense, right? That's what you expect. I mean, you ask for a list of process IDs for a non-existent process, so you kind of expect an empty string. That makes sense. So also, you know, the guy who created the pull request for Appium thought that. But as always, uh, things may vary sometimes. So this is a Samsung device, and then let's look what happens here. Same behavior. Oh, what is that? Why am I getting a list of all PIDs? What the hell? What? <laughs> you enter a process that doesn't exist and it gives you a list of all PIDs running on that device? And I'm gonna quote, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, and if you consider what I was telling you before, like, can you imagine what happens if Appium tries to kill every PID on a device? <laughs> uh, I certainly can. So the bug basically caused every Samsung device on the whole staging environment to break. And like realizing this, like digging down to finding this took, I think, half a day. And yeah, it's just super funny ex uh, example for weird behavior that you see on real devices sometimes. And that's it. So I'm gonna make this really fast because we have just enough time for this next speaker. He's actually a celebrity. He tours with a band singing and playing guitar. Phil Merwin's gonna talk about canary sight testing. Come on up. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked to be here. It's not doing it. <laughs> there it goes. Okay. So um, I work at CBT Nuggets, and what our company does is we sell IT training courses. I lost my browser. Hold on a minute. And we developed a suite of tests that we call Canary, like Canary in the coal mine. If Canary's sick, then everybody should get out of the mine because something's wrong, right? So my boss came to me about nine months ago and said, I want to run a series of tests in production as if it's a user using the website, spinning up videos, trying to run reports, etc." And I said, in production? We want to do that? <laughs> And he said, yes, absolutely. And I was like, okay. So we had some problems that we had to solve. So the first thing was we want to run these tests in parallel. And we have an issue where we can't use the same test user to log in five times because they're going to get denied from the auth service. So we developed a tool, my associate Levi, who's in the room, we developed a tool where we have a pool of users. And we can hit and check out users over via an API, we hit that route. We check out a user for the duration of the test. When the test is done, we can check him back in. So there's always a pool of users and there's always a, a user available. 
and they're, they're always um, specific to that test. So this is what our test run manager looks like. And so all of these guys are using that user tool. So these are all auth tests, right? So every time that they log in, they get a new user, they check the user back in, allows us to run in parallel. So we can still get inside auth pages run in parallel tests. So at the top, you see the summary, and we're running at 97%. So 97% of the past 65 passes are passing, right? So our site's doing good. This ensures that a learner on our site is getting what they're paying for, right? So they can log in, they can watch video, they can get to the reports page, they can get to their playlist, all that stuff, right? So these tests are designed to run really fast, to get in and out, run in parallel, find the problem, and bail. And one of the things we rely on extensively with Sauce Labs is extended debugging. So during these tests, which are really just an end-to-end -end test that runs real fast, we also look at the network logs. And we've found some interesting issues by doing that that we wouldn't have found otherwise because the front-end test may not throw an error when a service is. It's just not coded up, so you'd miss it. But that's something that a learner might see, right, in their experience of using the site. So the way that we do that is we use um, the Sauce Labs API to, to get the, the browser logs and the, the network logs from the browser, right? And then we, we say, when we get that object back, we ask if it's any of these error codes, then we're going to fail. So we fail the test, right? So this helps us know in real time when some of our services are taking errors that we might not normally see just from the user experience. And yeah, and that's, that's, that's allowed us to um, solve problems before our learners see them. We can, we can see it first. So these suites, we run them in, in QA, we run them in, and then we have a staging environment, and then, then they go to production, right? So when we're deploying a new feature, we can, we can kick off the, the test on stage just by running it manually. And then we have the test already scheduled in production constantly running. So if a bug slips through those environments or it happens after it gets deployed, which can happen, then we're still going to see it and we still know in real time what's happening. So anyway, that's Canary. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. That was awesome. Um, so up next is a craft beer break out in the hall.